Welcome to our A to J Author 2018 training series. This is Jessica Frank, A to J Author's Project Manager for the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. This is video three in a series of four videos for this year. This video will cover macros, functions, repeat loops, and advanced logic. The first two topics that we're gonna cover are macros and functions. On the agenda, first for variable macros, we'll discuss what they are, the format they have, where you can use them, and how to customize your interview with variable macros. Then we'll go into functions, including what they are, where you can use them, and the functions of age, date, today, has answered, contains, ordinal, sum, and some syntax reminders and additional resources. First, let's talk about variable macros. Variable macros are a way to call up the value of a variable in the question text in Learn More Prompts, in Learn More Answers, field labels, radio buttons, and signposts. They're a way to use information that the end user has already given you to further personalize the in interview for them. The format for a, a variable macro is double percent sign, bracket, name of the variable, close bracket, double percent sign. You can see the format here on the screen and an example of it in the text um, in the screenshot below. You can use a variable macro in several places in an A to J guided interview. You can use it in the question text itself, the learn more prompt, this is a new feature in A to J author six, in the learn more help, so the reply that the, end, that the guide avatar gives to the end user. You can use it in radio buttons, field labels, and in signposts. This is, an, this is an example of a variable macro in a question text. Here it's using the client's name that they have already given you to specifically ask them, Jessica, what is the name of the first person you want to be your agent? Here's an example of a variable macro in a learn more prompt. This is what the end user avatar is thinking. So why would I want Jane Doe to be my, cha my children's guardian too? And in the prompt uh, itself, when you as the author are designing it, you include the variable macro format, why would I want, double percent sign, bracket, name of uh, variable, close bracket, double percent sign. Um, and this allows the name that the end user has given you as their agent, their primary agent, to ask follow-up questions about that agent later on. This is an example of the learn more help, which is the reply that the guide avatar gives to the end user's learn more question. And here, variable macro is used both in the, in the learn more prompt, so why would I want Jane Doe to be my children's guardian? And again, in the learn more help, this can be for convenience, you're already trusting Jane Doe, blah, blah, blah. So you can see that it's both in the question from the end user and in the reply from the guide avatar. Variable macros can also be used in radio buttons. So if you want to ask follow-up questions about things or people or issues that they've told you about, you can use those here. And you use the variable macro format in the label for that button. Same for field labels, you use the macro in the label itself, and it will display the value held by that variable. Finally, you can use variable macros in step signs. Step signs are the indicators along the side of the road that show the end user how far they have to go to get to the courthouse and give context to what series of questions they're on. And you can use information that the end user has given you already, for example, their name, and use that in the signpost itself. You can do more than simply use a variable macro to insert the end user's name in an interview. In a loop for personal information, you can collect the end user's name first and then move on to follow-up questions. So for example, if you have a series of questions about their children, you can ask for the child's name up front and then use that name to say, what is Jane's birthday? Who is Jane's father? Where does Jane live? What school does Jane go to? To help remind the end user which child or person they're talking about and to help uh, guide them and give them context to the series of questions. You can also use it to display information that has been already collected in a loop. So for example, if you have a loop that asks um, an end user to enter their assets one at a time, you can have a learn more at the end of that loop that says, do you want to add any more? And the learn more says, um, what items have I already told you about? 
and then you use a variable macro to call out the items that the end user has already told you about. So you've told me about your house, your car, your boat, and as they continue on, it will continue to add um, values to that variable. And so the additional values will be displayed every time the end user hits that learn more. You can also use it when uh, gathering information about a person. So um, if, you if you have a question that figures out whether they have one child or multiple children, you can set a new variable called child or children TE to either the word child or the word children, and then use a variable macro to call out the appropriate word each time. Same for asset or assets, is or are, um, he or she, any of the words where you might use a slash because you don't know if the end user is one or the other, you can use questions to figure out which one is appropriate for your end user and then use a variable macro to call out that value each time. It customizes the interview for your end user um, in a way that is comforting and helpful to them and in a way that isn't particularly difficult for you as an author. Now we're gonna talk about functions. Functions are built-in actions performed to alter data that is collected. The format for a function is the name of the function, parentheses, brackets around the variable name, close brackets, close parentheses. This is the same format for any of the functions we're going to discuss today. Where can you use functions? You can use functions and they're most commonly used in logic. So this is an example of the age function which we'll talk about a little bit later. But this is saying if the client's birth date converted to a number, age, is less than 18, take them to a question that says, unfortunately, you don't qualify to complete this A to J guided interview. You must be over 18 years of age. So this is, functions are ways for you to manipulate the data the end user has given you in ways that allow you to branch them appropriately or to make the process easier for your end users. You can use functions in question text itself. So here I am taking the notice date. They've told me what day they received the notice. I'm adding 30 days to it, and I'm converting that number to a date. So instead of saying you have 30 days to complete uh, your answer or to submit your answer to the court, you can instead say you must file a response with the court by 8-31-2017, for example. This makes it easier for your end user. You're giving them a concrete date rather than requiring them to do the math and it's fairly easy to program this into A to J author. So the first of the functions that we'll talk about are is age. This converts a date to an age in years. So I showed you that example um, that, for, for example, if the form requires a birth date for all users, but limits the form to people over 18, you can only, you the successful end user, therefore would have to answer the birth date and if they're over 18. So instead of making the person who is supposed to use the form have to answer two questions, you can just have everybody ask one question, what's your birth date, and then use logic and functions to test whether they are over 18 as well. So this branches people easily without having to think about two sets of questions or whether they're over 18, just ask for the age for everyone and then do the, the co computation on the back end. The syntax for this is age, which is the function, parentheses, variable in brackets, close parentheses. The next one to talk about is date. Date converts days, so 30 um, added to a variable date into the month, month, day, day, year, 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 year format. So I showed you an example of this already, but here you can determine a deadline for an answer 30 days from the notice date. Note that with the math here, it's adding 30 actual days to the variable, um, whatever the date that you're adding to, um, and then converting that into a date. So um, it doesn't take into account court holidays or weekends. So if your court has restrictions like that, this isn't really gonna work for you. But if your court is just straight 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, for example, um, this would work to give your end user a date rather than um, 30 days from the day you receive the notice. Um, you can just tell them August 31st, 2017. Today's fun the today function returns today's date. So a way this is used commonly is to determine if a user is within a statute of limitations. So you can use, um, for example, in the screenshotted logic here, 
if today minus the incident date is greater than 90. So whatever today's date minus whatever they told you the incident date was is greater than 90 days, then you're gonna go to a page that says, I'm sorry, you don't qualify, you don't meet the statute of limitations. Today is also commonly used as a limiter for the calendar. When you have a date field in a question, you can use today either to be the minimum or the maximum, and the calendar will not allow an end user to type in um, either a date in the past or a date in the future, or to even see them on the calendar dropdown itself. Has answered um, returns either a true or a false value, telling whether or not a variable has a value if it has been if it has been answered. This is commonly used for combining an end user's name into something like client full name. So not everyone has a middle name. So you want to test before you set client full name to client first name, client middle name, client last name. You want to test if the if the end user has a middle name because if they don't have a middle name, you're going to have an extra space in between first and last name that's going to look a little awkward. So here the logic example is um, if has answered client middle name, set full name to first space middle last. Otherwise, else, set full name to just first and last name. The syntax is the word has answered all in caps, parentheses around uh, the variable which is in brackets as well. Contains is a fairly new function to A to J Author 6. This evaluates if a variable contains a specific text string. So this is used, it was actually requested from our friends in Canada who were looking for if a postal code, the equivalent of their zip code, contained a certain series of numbers or letters um, to, to properly put people in the right bucket of where they should be um, based on where they lived. So they wanted to know if a variable like postal code contained some string, some chunk of letters or numbers. Um, and that's what the contain function does. You can also use it, for example, if you want to identify people who say they have issues related to domestic violence or um, children or poverty or something like that when they're answering the what's your legal problem question. So here, my screenshot example says if contains legal problems, you have the, the syntax is the word contains, parentheses, bracket around the variable name, comma, and then whatever value you're looking for in quotes, close parentheses. So if the variable legal problem TE contains the word violence, I wanna take them to a follow-up question that's gonna ask them more about what their potential domestic violence issue might be. So this is a way to search within a variable for a specific text string. And the syntax is a little bit different than the other functions. Um, but it follows similar principles with the, the parentheses, the variable name um, with brackets, and the function in all caps. Ordinal is another common um, function. Ordinal returns the ordinal form of a number. It's usually used with the repeat loops counting variable. So what is your first asset, fourth asset, 57th kid? Um, and the syntax here is just ordinal with uh, parentheses around the child count. You don't need the brackets in this instance because child count does not have a space in it. If your variable has a space in it, you would need brackets though. Sum is a function that returns the total value of all values entered for a repeating variable. So for example, if you ask the end user one at a time what their monthly expenses are or their income, and then you use the function sum to total that up. So you want to set client total expense value NU to the sum of client expense value NU. So one at a time, it's been adding up and indexing uh, uh, each expense in the variable client expense value NU. And now you're telling A to J to add up all those values and set a new value called client total expense value NU to whatever that sum is. This is particularly helpful when you can gather the information one at a time from an end user and do the math for them. Either they don't have a calculator or they might do the math wrong. This ensures that the math is done properly each time. A couple of reminders and additional resources. Whenever um, you have a function, make sure to wrap the variable name in parentheses. And anytime you have a variable with spaces, that variable must be wrapped in brackets. 
To show the value of a variable or a function when applied in question text, you wrap the phrase in a macro. So um, if you want to have the um, whatever the function result was to be displayed to the end user, you can do so using a variable macro, which is what we just talked about in the last section. So a list of all functions that are supported by A to J author can be found at a to J author.org slash content slash functions. It's in the authoring guide under the function section. The next section will cover repeat loops, advanced logic, and tips and tricks. So what is a repeat loop? A repeat loop, also known as a repeat dialog, is a series of questions that will display to the end user multiple times based upon that user's input. You use a repeat loop if you want to collect the same type of information several times and you don't want to have to create the same questions over and over again. Commonly a repeat loop is used when you want to collect maybe information about multiple children and you want to ask a series of questions about each individual child or you can use it to collect income information, asking for their, in, their sources of income one at a time, expenses, asking for each expense one at a time, or perhaps assets that need to be dispersed in a divorce. You can ask for each information about each one of those assets one at a time without having to create multiple series of questions for the same information. There are two ways in A to J author to do repeat loops and both have the same outcome, but they have a different front end interaction with the end user. So the first way we're gonna talk about is collecting the number of items or the number of people, the number of times the end user has to go through the loop first. You ask them up front for that number. The second way is to ask if there are any more items or people at the end of the question uh, series of loops. And when I get to each one of these, I'll talk about uh, the best case for where they use them. So the first way is collecting the number up front. You're gonna use this when your end user is going to know right away how many times they need to go through the loop, and you ask for that number. So for example, the, the, um, the example I always use is when how many children somebody has. That theoretically should be a fairly easy question for somebody to answer. Um, they're not gonna have to think about it or go through a list first to figure out if they have more children to add at the end. So you can ask them upfront how many children they have and right away uh, you as the author are telling the software how many times it has to go through the loop. Okay, so the first two steps, you create the set of questions that will, will repeat. So I like as an author to have a script or an outline going forward so I know what questions I have to ask before I actually dive into the software. So I know ahead of time that, um, for example, if I'm asking about children, I know that the form's gonna ask for their name, their birth date, and their father's name, for example. So I, I create those three questions. So I um, create the variables that I'm gonna need, so child name, first name, child last name, child middle name if you need it, uh, child date of birth, and uh, father child father uh, te name so I create those I make the questions three separate questions and then I go back to the variables tab and I create a counting variable the counting variable is going to be a way for for the software to track how many times the user has gone through a set of questions it has to be a number on the variables tab so it, uh, the type has to be number we also uh, generally use a different naming convention than we do for, for um, other variables. One, because this variable is not going to be used in hot dogs. So um, it doesn't have to follow any kind of naming convention. Also, um, it lets me see right away that it is a counting variable and it's not a variable that's used in question text to, that's not filled in by the end user. So I, uh, the, the naming convention I follow is, for example, here, child count. Both child and count are capitalized, no space, and no two-letter uh, indicator at the end to indicate the number time, I, uh, the number type. I don't have NU after it. So just child count. Whatever you name it, it does have to be a number variable type. The third step is to create the first question in the, in the loop. This first question is a jumping off point. It's not going to be repeated to the end user. They're not gonna to have to answer how many children several times. So they only need to answer it once. It's a jumping off point. So on this how many question, you on step four, 
um, at, at, the, at the destination um, on, on the button section under destination. So the destination question should be the first question that's actually going to be repeated. So you can see in this screenshot on the bottom right that it is two dash child's name. That's my very first question that will be repeated. Repeat options. By default, it says normal, but there is a little drop down menu. You're going to click on that and you're going to select set counting variable to one. And you're going to tell A to J what counting variable to use. So I start typing child's count, it auto populates. Um, and now A to J is set when the end user clicks this button, the continue, after they say how many kids they have, they hit continue. A to J is going to set child count to one. So it knows that this is now, they're jumping into that first loop. Then step five on all the questions that are to be repeated. So um, actually in my example here, I have two questions that will be repeated, the child's name and the child's birth date. On both of those questions, under the text section, you can see here it's right under help audio, there's a field called counting variable. It's usually left blank, but when you're doing repeat loops, you need to tell A to J that this question is part of the, a loop, and the loop it is part of is the loop tied to the counting variable child count. So you put the child count variable there, and on every question that is to be repeated. You can see in the map section that uh, in the yellow column here, how many children is a number pick variable and it has no loop. So you can tell when something is part of a repeat loop because we have a little icon that looks like this circle arrow with the word loop. So that tells me that I have put child count in that counting variable field on child's name and child's birth date. The next type of uh, question, or the next type of repeat loops that we're gonna talk about is that asking to add more at the end. So you can see that the loop is also on these two purple questions, two dash S at name and three dash anymore. This is just a way to see quickly if uh, your question is part of a loop. This little loop symbol also shows up on the pages tab at the end of the question's name if it's part of a loop. Step six is on the very last question that's going to be repeated. So in my case, it's child's birth date. If you remember, I had one dash how many children, two dash child's name, and three dash birth date, child's birth date. On this last question, I'm going to tell A to J that when they click the button, the continue button, after they give me their kid's birth date, I want to increment counting variable and add the, variable, the counting variable child count. So I tell A to J that basically they've finished the loop once uh, and go ahead and mark that the loop is complete. Um, so we have incremented the counting loop. We've told A to J that the end user has finished the loop. Now we have to create some logic to test against, uh, to test child count against how many times they told us they needed to go through the loop, which is stored in the variable, in my example, number of children and you. So we create this condition that you can see in the screenshot at the bottom of the screen here. So if child count equals number of children, so they've gone through the loop the number of times they said they had to go through the loop, I want to send them to a question called one dash do you have any so move them out of the loop into the next section otherwise so if child count they haven't gone through the number of times they said they needed to go through send them back to that first question in that's to be repeated which is two dash child's name so if true send them out of the loop if false take them back to the beginning question of the loop and let them go again, which will set the counter again each time after they hit the continue button. The second way of doing repeat loops, which is asking to add more at the end. You use this in the case when an end user is likely not to know how many times they have to go through the loop, and you ask them if they wanna add another one at the end. So for example, many people don't know offhand how many assets over $100 they have. But if they start making a list, and I'll show you a way to remind people of what they've already told you. So if they start making a list, they may eventually be like, yes, okay, and this, and this, and this, and this, rather than asking them, you know, I have 3,000 things over $100 or 10 things over $100. You wouldn't know necessarily off the top of your head how many times you have to go through the loop. Same thing create as uh, the other way. Step one, create that set of questions you want repeated. 
So um, for this example, I have the name of the asset and how much it's worth is uh, the only question in my loop. Um, so then you also create a counting variable, just like the other way. This one is called asset count, it's also a number. Um, on the first question, which is the jumping off point, the do you have any, because you don't want to send somebody through a loop if they don't actually have any assets or any things to tell you about. So the first question has two paths, a yes and a no path. This is the do you have any question. If yes, go into the loop, which we'll talk about here on step three. If no, branch them out of the loop uh, to the next set of questions. So on that yes button, the destination is to dash asset name, which is my first question to be repeated in this loop. I'm going to set the counting variable to one again. I'm initializing the count, and the counting variable is asset count. On the no button, you would just branch them out to the next one. There's nothing uh, you would have to do. The destination is the next question, and the repeat options is normal because they're not ever going to touch the loop. On all of the questions that you want repeated, you throw this counting variable into the counting variable field. You do not put it on that do you have any question. You can see again that the loop symbol is showing up on the map. Step five on the last question. So um, in my example, I have that do you have any question? That's number one. Two is asset name and it's gonna asset value. It's a two part question there. It's a two field question. And the third question in my section here is, do you have any more to add? Do you have another? Um, this do you have another question is repeated to the end user. So it is the last question in your loop. Um, and it is uh, it will have that counting variable assigned to it. So it is part of the loop because it gets asked each time. On this one, there are again two paths. Yes, takes them back through the loop. No, takes them out of the loop. So on the yes button, on this last question that's being repeated to the end user, the destination is that asset name, that second question, the first question in the loop. Um, we're gonna increment the counting variable and we're gonna tell A to J which counting variable to increment, which is asset count. So again, this is telling the software the end user has been through the loop and has finished the loop. On the no button, you just branch them out, they're done. So you take them to whatever the next step or next section is, next question, um, and the repeat options are normal. And then you're done, there's no logic in the asking to add more section. Um, you just keep having the end user manually push themselves through the loop. So variables in general, in a repeat dialogue, in any question that's repeated are treated exactly norm uh, the same. Um, they're set up the same way, child name first TE, the only difference, which I'll show you in A to J here, my sample, is on the variables tab. If it is to be repeated, you have to make sure that the variable is set to check if multiple values. Let me zoom in on that. This tells A to J to allow multiple values to be held by this variable. If you don't check this, every time the end user goes through a loop, they're gonna override the answer before. So if it only if you don't have this checked, A to J only allows one answer, so each time it overrides an answer, the last answer. If this is checked, multiple values can be held by this variable and A to J will start indexing them and separating them out. So that's the only difference with variables. That uh, asset count or child count, whatever your counting variable is, do not, check this because it's a normal number. It does not need to hold multiple values. It only needs to hold the one value, um, whatever the count is. And the only difference on a question in general um, that is part of a repeat loop is that you have this repeating uh, counting variable in the question text section that you indicate that it's part of the loop. Um, and the way, so what I was going to show you is a way in which you can help your end user remember which part of the loop they're on or which asset or which child they're talking about or what they've already told you about. So for example, on this, do you have any more for the assets? I'm gonna give them help. They might think, um, which ones have I already told you about? And I'm going to help them by pulling out all of the values they've told me about using a macro. But it's simple, all you have to say is, uh, all you as the author have to type in, is you've told me about your, and then use a macro 
to call out all of the values held in the variable asset name TE. This is particularly helpful on the um, asking to add more at the end because it reminds them what they've already told you about. Most people aren't going to have a pad of paper sitting next to them at the computer and they're not going to be jotting down what they've already told you about. So this gives them that information quickly. And A to J automatically adds a, a comma and the word and if there's more than one. Um, it starts building the list grammatically for you. The other way to use a macro in uh, repeat loops is to use the ordinal function. So for example, I am using a macro to call out the ordinal value held by child count, which you remember is a number. So what this will display to the end user the first time they're through the loop will say, what is the name of the first child? Next time they go through, what is the name of the second child? And so forth. Um, and then I use this macro to call out the child's name specifically in the next question. So the first question they tell me the name of their child and then in the next question I say what is that child's date of birth. So what is Allison or Benjamin's or Thomas's date of birth. And I do that with a macro um, percent sign percent sign bracket child's name first TE which is my variable pound the counting variable close brackets double percent signs. So what this tells A to J is call out the value of child for name first TE pound because it's indexing those multiple values whatever count they're currently on. So each time it will only call out the name of the child held by whatever iteration of the loop the end user is in rather than with the asset one where I didn't have pound asset count it calls out all the values. So this is a way to call out a specific value rather than all of the values held by a variable. Let's see if this one's working. Okay, so this is an example then, uh, what I was just talking about. Um, we'll run quickly through the sample interview I've created. If at any time you all would want this sample to check out in your own um, account and to play with, feel free to email me and I can um, drop it over to you. So this is just a quick sample exercise or a uh, sample interview that I created. Um, whenever I'm working an author, I like to keep this variables and script window open, but it doesn't have to be open. This is what it would look like if um, it was seen by an end user. Let me zoom a bit for you. Okay, so for example, if we just run through this, how many children? I have a list that only allows one through nine, two children, first name. Now what is Allison's date of birth? Now it's gone through the loop. If we open up the script, it tested logic to see if I've gone through the loop appropriate number of times. I haven't because child count, which I said was two, does not equal, or sorry, number of children, which I said was two, does not equal child count because I'd only gone through the count uh, once. And it's also incremented child count to two now, so that's why it's showing what is the name of the second child. Again, it's calling out a specific birth date. So now, if you notice the on line 20 here, it's green, it's true, because child count does equal number of children, and now it has moved me on to the do you have any question. So here is, do you have any assets? Um, yes, I do have assets. Asset of a house. Do I have another to add? So which ones have I already told you about? You've told me about your house. If I say yes, I have another one. Car. What have, how many, or do you have any more? What have I told you about? I've told you about your my house and car. If I kept going, it would add a comma in and keep this and there. And it will continue to make the list for the end user. If I click no, it bounces me out to the end of the interview. So that's just a quick example to see how repeat loops act in person. The last section we have to cover in this video is advanced logic. The advanced logic section in A to J Author 6 allows you to script if else statements either before the end user sees the question or after the end user presses the button. The advanced logic section has five commands that you can use, 
if, else, go to, set, and end if. That's it. Just like every sentence has to have a capital at the capital letter at the beginning and some punctuation at the end, all if statements have to have an if at the beginning and an end if at the end. And each logic statement command must be on its own line. So you need a hard return or the enter key between if, else, go to, set, and end if. A great feature in A to J Author 6 that allows you to see all of the logic in your interview without having to open up each individual question is the All Logic tab. So you access this from within your interview and then you open, you click on the All Logic tab. And this allows you to see every logic statement that's available in your interview. You can also make changes and edits if needed, and you'll be able to see if any of your logic statements have issues. If A to J Author detects an improper logic statement, it will turn the box red, and it will also give you some sort of indicator about what the problem is, like unknown syntax, unrecognized variable. Those kind of warnings give you some sort of indicator as to what's wrong with your interview. When you make the corrections and you click out of the box, if everything is okay, then the box will turn white again. If you have questions about what a lot one of the logic warnings means, you can always email me, jessica at cali.org. We also have an FAQ on our website under the Learn Resources, the Learn tab at the top of the page, that tells you what common error messages are and how to fix them. With advanced logic, you can do simple mathematical expressions. So for example, if you want to set a variable that is their annual income, you can use math to multiply what they've told you their monthly income is by 12. You can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. You can also use AND or OR in a logic statement to combine two different conditions to test against. So here in the sample logic statement, I'm testing whether the number of children is greater than one and the household size is less than three. If so, I wanna take them to some other question um, there. So you can use AND or OR to make more advanced logic statements. Here are some of the examples of uh, symbols that can be used in advanced logic statements. You can use the equal symbol, not equal, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, and the word is also means uh, equals. Now we'll talk about some tips and tricks for creating guided interviews in general. We recommend that you start with some sort of script or outline. How detailed that script or outline is is up to you. Some authors have a full script that details every question, every word, every variable that's going to be answered, and is specifically how that field is going to look and how those interview questions are going to look. Um, maybe that's drafted by their subject matter expert, or maybe it's drafted by the developer themselves. Some just have a simple outline of what they need to cover in each section um, and bullet points. It's up to you, but we do recommend that you start with something before you get to the interview itself so that it keeps you on track and make sure that you're not doing a lot of moving around or trying to edit in questions after the fact. If you're looking to translate your interview, A to J Author supports 15 different languages. You can find those languages under the About section. On the first page of the About section, it has a Languages option. You can see the 15 different languages that A to J supports. That means that A to J translates the chrome around the interview. So the back, the next, the exit, continue, yes, no, that kind of thing. But we don't translate the actual text of the question itself. That's up to you as authors to get that translated. If you're looking for help with those translations, you can hire uh, translators or you can have someone in your office do it. And if they're not familiar with the software, you can pull a text report under the reports tab that just has the text of the questions that need to be edited and the field labels and the button labels and that kind of thing, anything that would need to be translated. But it doesn't have the variables or any of the background metadata about the interview. It's a very clean version for translators to work off of. And then finally, a uh, full report is available for you also under the report tab. If you're looking to share for editing or peer reviewing purposes, or you want to send it off to a subject matter expert to review the entire interview without having to make them click through all the different branches of the interview, you can generate a full report and they can read the interview itself. Additional resources that might be helpful for you is our authoring guide first. The authoring guide is about 300 pages. It's a software manual. 
um, and it's available at a to jauthor.org slash content slash a to j dash authoring dash guide. It's also available under the learn tab on our website at the top. Um, and this will give you complete instructions on how to use any aspect of the software. Sample exercises also available under the learn tab. These are exercises that you can learn that you can use to learn A to J author hot docs and the A to J dat better. We also, if you're interested in the A to J dat, which will be covered in the next training video, um, you can also check out chapter 15 of the authoring guide that focuses specifically on the uh, document assembly tool. And then you're all welcome to attend our new user webinars. They're generally the first Thursday of each month and they run February through December of each year at 11 a.m. Central Time. As always, if you have questions, you can feel free to email me, jessica at cali.org. Thank you.